In this lesson series, we'll try to answer the question, what are we made of? And that answer is going to be cells. Now, life on Earth is cellular, and because cells are small, progress in understanding life had to await the invention of the microscope. But for thousands of years, uh, we understood the human body to be composed of these things we call organs, but there was considerable confusion in history as to what these organs did. Today, of course, we understand the heart is a pump. That's a metaphor. The heart is pumping blood around our body. The lungs are doing gas exchange, absorbing oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide waste. The brain is processing information. And the little electrically excitable cellular units that we call neurons are processing information. Sometimes they're growing stronger synapses and making memories. And sometimes we can reactivate those neurons and retrieve a memory. And our brains are making decisions. Brains are doing all kinds of complex things. But in ancient times, 2,000 years ago, the, the Greeks and the Romans did not really understand well what these organs were doing. By the 1700s, scientists began to more systematically dissect organs. And they found that different organs in the body were composed of different structural elements that had different visible characteristics and, and other kinds of qualities. And they identified those elements as tissues. So, for example, the heart had a lot of muscle tissue. You could find nerve tissue in the heart. Of course, nerve tissue was also found in the brain and the central nervous system. Uh, you could find cardiac, or, or sorry, um, you could find uh, connective tissue in the heart, but you could find that elsewhere in the body. You could find fat tissue surrounding the heart. Fat tissue was also found elsewhere in the body. So the idea is, is that organs were composed of tissues, but each kind of tissue might be present in multiple organs. But of course, it raised the question, well, what are tissues composed of? And here's where microscopes uh, become important, because to really see what tissues are composed of, you need to magnify the tissues. Up top here, we see a low-power image of cardiac muscle tissue. And these elongated units, these cylindrical units, are muscle cells. Here's a magnified uh, image, and we can see these kind of uh, cylindrical units here. That would be one muscle cell cardiac referring to the heart now interestingly these uh, blue stained objects those are nuclei now typically in the body each body cell has one nucleus per cell but muscle cells are different they have multiple nuclei now why was the microscope of course important in understanding life on earth because again these cells are really small to get an idea of how small cells are, we can use this analogy. At the bottom here, we see the North American continent. Imagine that's the size of your body, your entire body. Well, at that scale, then, the Sierra Nevada mountain range would be the size of an organ, maybe your heart or your lungs or something like that. Now, we're going to be zooming in the top picture here. So here we have the mountain range up here, and here we see an ocean liner. It looks like a tractor trailer there, and maybe there's a couple little people on the uh, pier. Let's zoom in and see. That ocean liner, then, would be the size of a cell. So again, back up here, if our body is the size of a continent, the mountain range would be the size of an organ, the ocean liner would be the size of a cell. The tractor trailer would be the size of some molecular structure inside the cell, like the nucleus, be the size of the nucleus. And here we see a person and a cat on the pier. The cat would be the size of a chain molecule, like maybe DNA or a protein. Uh, the marble would be the size of a simple molecule, like an amino acid or a sugar, like glucose. And the BB would be the size of an atom. So we can see then cells are much larger than atoms, but much smaller, of course, than the entire body. But that gives us a sense of the relative scale of cells. So we need microscopes to understand life on Earth here. Well, this was uh, an early microscope used by Robert Hooke. It was a compound microscope, meaning it had two glass lenses in this tube. And together, those lenses would magnify whatever object was placed on the stage. And Hooke put all kinds of different things and made beautiful pictures in a famous book of his. But he also um, he took a sharp, sharp instrument and cut a very thin section of cork, the familiar cork you might find in a wine bottle. And here's a famous picture in one of his books. We have a thin section of cork, and we see it to be composed of these chambers. 
Now, he thought they looked like small rooms where in the Middle Ages, monks would copy Bibles. And so he called them cells for small rooms. Now, cork is, was once living tissue. It, the cork in a wine bottle is dead plant tissue. But cork out there on the bark of a tree is alive. And so, you know, we can harvest the cork and, and put it to our uses. But what, what Hook was doing then was looking at a once living tissue under the microscope. So these chambers he calls cells, but when he was looking at cork, it's dead tissue. And so these chambers were empty. In living cork tissue, these chambers would be filled with a fluid. So he was observing the kind of the, the skeletal remains, if you will, of plant cells, but he just did not understand the significance of his observation. He had no chance of understanding that all life on earth is cellular. He just identified these chambers and called them cells. And it would take another uh, 200 years to establish the fact that uh, uh, all living things on earth are composed of cells. Another early user of microscope was Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Now he used a very different kind of microscope seen here in this picture here. It's actually a small device. Uh, if we uh, magnify a little bit or just crop in the image, we can see the lens of this microscope is that little bead of glass. Now uh, Leeuwenhoek was very good at polishing and creating these little lenses. So he would put the specimen on this little pin here and these screws down here would allow him to move the specimen up and down and closer to the lens or farther away. Now these lenses were so well polished that he could get magnifications of a couple of hundred times. So these were high quality lenses. Now he didn't use them initially to study living things. In fact, he was in the cloth trade. So he would put sections of cloth on his microscope to examine the quality of cloth, like the thread count, for example. But in time, he started to put other things on his microscope including some rainwater that it collected outside his home. So imagine putting a little tiny drop of rainwater there and then positioning it. And he was looking from the other side of the microscope through that lens at the little drop of rainwater. And what he saw shocked him. He saw a menagerie of tiny little moving creatures and he immediately suspected they were living creatures. Now, this is a scene under a modern uh, light microscope, so he would not have seen this kind of clear imagery. But nevertheless, you can get a sense of the surprise that he might have had to see things swimming around in a drop of uh, rainwater. In this uh, scene here, we see those little brown cigar-shaped things. Those are single-celled organisms called paramecia. The green kind of trumpet-like things are called stentor, also single-celled. This big silvery blob here is another single-celled organism called amoeba. But the important discovery then that Leeuwenhoek made was he discovered living creatures in a drop of rainwater. Nobody knew these things existed until microscopes were invented. So while Hook observed empty chambers and he coined the word cells, Leeuwenhoek discovered living cellular creatures in a drop of rainwater. And he found similar kinds of things in pond water. He had a friend go get some ocean water for him, for him and he found more living things swimming around and crawling around. And he wrote, this was to me among all the marvels that I've discovered in nature, the most marvelous among them all. No greater pleasure has yet come to my eye than the spectacle of the thousands of living creatures in a drop of water. This was a profound discovery that life on earth was just not limited to the big things, animals and plants, but life could be tiny. And in fact, it was the beginning of the understander that understanding that life on earth was cellular. It's just the big things like animals and plants are going to be composed of many cells stuck together. Today, we have more sophisticated microscopes. This is a scanning electron microscope picture. It's really good at showing us the uh, surface features of tiny things. The big brown bell-shaped thing is didinium, and this is our cigar-shaped organism called a paramecium. They're both single-celled organisms. It's just that didinium is the predator, 
Paramecium is the prey. Paramecium, you see, is covered with these hair-like structures called cilia. We see some cilia here, too, on didinium as well. And they can wave around in the water, and that's how they propel themselves through the water, so they can swim. Both of them are good swimmers. Let's see what this interaction looks like in real time under a light microscope. Now here we see a didinium swimming around. And now we're going to cut to a scene where a didinium has used a sort of like a a sort of a, like a little lasso with a barb on it and it kind of whips it around and it can latch on to a a paramecium that is swimming by and then the didinium will draw the paramecium into the didinium so it looks like the didinium is not much bigger than the paramecium but didinium will be able to ingest engulf the entire paramecium so didinium is eating the paramecium and this of course is a feature of life on earth living things on earth are cellular and cells need to get energy and building materials from the environment and one common way living things do that is by consuming other living things so here we have cell eating another cell Leeuwenhoek also uh, one day uh, scraped his teeth and he put that material on his microscope and he found the tiniest of of creatures today we would identify them as bacteria so he's probably one of the first ones to observe bacteria on earth let's see what they look like under the light microscope here we see some bacteria using dark field microscopy so you you kind of change up the lighting scenario so the background appears dark and now the bacteria are being illuminated from the side so they appear bright Here's normal light microscopy. Here is a party of bacteria at lower power than the previous images. Here again we have a mass of bacteria and you can see the individual cells here on the surface. Here we have a, a higher magnification view of a different species of bacteria. And here again yet another kind of bacteria. So these are living organisms. They are the smallest cells on earth and again, Leeuwenhoek, using his small little microscope, but with very good lenses, was able to um, discover the existence of these tiny cellular creatures. Again, using a scanning electron microscope, a modern uh, sophisticated microscope, here we see a single bacterium, a single bacteria cell, covered with these objects that look like spaceships. And the coloration here a computer has colorized these things but these blue spaceship like objects are viruses so this bacterium is being attacked by virus particles now what viruses do they're parasites they are uh, little uh, units um, kind of uh, some kind of boundary and then inside the virus will be either DNA or RNA the genetic material that has the information to build a virus the virus will attach to a cell inject its genetic material into the cell and then hijack the machinery inside the cell so the cell starts to make more viruses and when all those viruses burst out of the cell the cell will die down here we see a different kind of microscope image again of a bacterium with the virus particles attached to the bacterium and so with the work of some of these early scientists using the newly invented microscope Robert Hooke coins the word cell to refer to these chambers that he saw but he didn't understand that all life was composed of cells Leeuwenhoek makes a discovery that there are tiny living cellular units and these two then began us on this journey towards our modern understanding that life on earth is cellular in the next lesson we'll see the scientists were also investigating the microscopic structure of plants and animals and they too would be discovered to be composed of cells <laughs>